This is Strictly Business. On the program today, we follow the happenings of the mining in Daba in South Africa. Haka Indehichilema, president of Zambia, is attending this. He left the country yesterday. We want to know where Zambia is on the radar when it comes to Southern African mining countries and how they are performing. We will be following those happenings and more. Then we talk about... Um, the mining in Daba, obviously this will have to talk about how many minerals Zambia and many Southern African countries have and what this will do for not only Zambia, but the African continent. President Haka Indehichilema is part of many very important delegates in South Africa for the next two days. We get to fuel. Well, fuel, that's not the bone of contention. The price went up, then it came slightly down. What impact would this have on the consumers what impact will this pricing have on the production costs of businesses these and more items on strictly business it's, it's good if they are even planning to start the digital transformation journey because uh, if you don't start definitely your business will become irrelevant going into the future This is Strictly Business. My name is Judy Ngulube. A lot has been happening in the, over the weekend when it comes to issues of business. When you talk about, uh, you know, the railway industry, a contractor working on the damaged Tazara Zambia Railway Authority Tazara Railway Line bridge across the Chambeshi River in Muchinga province has assured government that works on the project will be completed by July 2022, which is this year. And then First Quantum Minerals, FQM, the nation's largest Copper Mine has unveiled a 1.35 billion United States dollar package of new projects. Now, talking about FQM, this brings us to our very first insight for Strictly Business. Issues of minerals in Southern Africa, issues of minerals and mining specifically for Zambia. President Haka Indehichilema says that in order to meet the target to produce 3 million tons of copper in the next 10 years, domestic and foreign investment is very cardinal for the mining industry. These are some of the sentiments that he spoke of when he was leaving the country yesterday. He says the 2022 national budget has actually outlined a target to produce this 3 million tons of copper and other minerals, of course, and hence undertaking this trip to South Africa, which is just meant to unlock opportunities for Zambia as a country. What you see on your screens, he is part of those presidents that will be taking part in this endeavor. Of course, um, we go with a delegation where we have Paul Kabuswe, um, Minister of Mines, who will also be interacting with various people at this Indaba. And uh, when you talk about mining and what Paul Kabuswe has said about this, he had actually just said that government's commitment of reviving the mining sector in Zambia and it will be, he will make sure that it will respond to the needs of the country. The interactions that we have, they promise that not only domestic investments, but also international investment will bring job creation and also the mining industry back to the ways that we've known it always to have. And of course, Kabuse says that Zambia is a major player in the mining sector in Africa. Hence, there is need to place effective policy measures that will make the industry viable and also contribute positively to the country's economic agenda. And he also said while well, at uh, the mining in Daba, the Africa mining industry in Daba, that government will continue to interact with other players in the industry to woo more investments that will benefit the country. And President Haka Inde Hichilema says that both domestic and foreign investments are very key to the country to meet the target that is the 3 million tons of copper, talking about planning for the future in the next 10 years. And uh, President Haka Inde Hichilema says job creation, growth of business will also come out of this investment. And earlier today, he was actually just saying at the Indaba that Africa has got so many minerals that have not been exploited. And if Africa doesn't exploit this, including Zambia, 
the potential of the jobs it can create, the potential that Zambia has when it comes to making sure that the agenda for the 2063, which is the Africa we want, will not be met. He also touched on the issue of how peace, stability, corruption really does hamper on investments when it comes to international reactions. A lot is going on at the Indaba Collaborative. So many uh, stakeholders who are taking part at this Indaba are really just making sure that synergies are made synergies are met and there's this narrative of wanting to change not only Zambia, Congo or South Africa but making sure that Africa is moving together as a whole. This uh, mining endeavor goes on up to the 12th. We will be following it very closely just to make sure that we see what Zambia can get from this. You're watching Strictly Business. Let's just uh, also interest you in issues of fuel. But let me tell you what's coming up after this. It, it's good if they are even planning to start the digital transformation journey because uh, if you don't start, definitely your business will become irrelevant going into the future. This is Strictly Business. Now, earlier on, I spoke of how the bone of contention isn't the issue of fuel going up or down, but it's the impact that it has on the production cost. It's the impact that it has on the consumers and everyday businesses that are running in our country. We have an economist as well as a dean of um, the dean from the School of Business from Texila American University to help me talk about this. This is Mr. Alec Gumbo. Thank you so much for coming through to Strictly Business. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. All right. How are you feeling today? I'm okay. Okay. All right. Now, when you talk about fuel and the impact it has, let's talk about the general impact, the fluctuation of the prices it's having on firstly the production costs and then the consumers. Okay. Um, we all understand the fact that uh, fuel is uh, the driving or the engine of every economy in whatever context you may want to interpret it. So now if you have a situation where you have uh, the pricing not being stable, firstly it will disturb the manner in which uh, uh, businesses uh, mm -hmm. plan for their production in the first place because uh, you have a different price today and you need to adjust your uh, pricing for the output mm -hmm. that you are producing because you have to balance up, you have to uh, equalize, you have to break even and also make a profit. So now if you have a different price every month, like mm -hmm. the case has been where there's a fluctuation almost at the end of every month, mm -hmm. that makes it extremely, extremely challenging for the uh, business environments, for the producers for, for that matter to a certain a price. So what that will do in the long run is that uh, uh, the producers will peg a higher price mm. preparing for any event that will, uh, may come along with the pricing issue because they are not too sure about how the next price of fuel is going to be. So to protect themselves and the profitability of the business, they will page a higher price. Is that, a, is that a survival mechanism they should be using? Literally not. Um, in an ideal situation, we are supposed to have a stable uh, price regime for both consumables and non-consumables. But in an event where I'm a producer and I'm not certain with how much my cost of production is going to be tomorrow because of the uncertainty that is uh, surrounding the, the, the main driving force, which is fuel, what do I do to protect my business? I'll have to page a higher price even when I know that I'm able to hit that production without having to uh, price it at that level for me to protect myself in the long run. But of then course, again, what is the happening. one who's bearing the impact is going to be the, the consumer. consumer. Certainly. How does the consumer survive in this case then? The challenge that we have is that uh, outrightly the consumer is going to bear this burden. And um, I, I want to mention that uh, this is what happens when the pricing for essential commodities such as fuel is not stable. The punishment or the outright punishment goes to the consumer, you and me, the consumers of the products. So literally, if we have to harmonize this situation, we need to work around, first of all, stabilizing the price mechanism. How are we going to zero into the supply chain for our fuel? 
how what does it take for a fuel to reach Zambia? And if there's a slight change in price, how do we cushion that so that in the long run we are able to uh, manage up with the prevailing price rather than having to change everything? So looking at our current situation in our country, yeah. how do we stabilize, how do we cushion with all the current you know, uh, key economic factors and what's happening currently in our country? It is very difficult and challenging on the side of uh, uh, both government and uh, the players in the fuel uh, supply chain. Why do I say so? We do not have a buffer as uh, Zambia where government places a certain amount of money because we've rem literally removed the subsidy on fuel. So what that does now is that you have removed the shield that is between the suppliers and we, the consumers. So in the absence of that shield, we have to be adjusting to what the, uh, the, the, the main suppliers are dictating. So in this event, for us to protect the the consumer, government may have to consider a buffer to place in between. And this buffer comes in as a slight percentage of the subsidy. But in literally in the absence of that, we may want to expect that going forward, the consumers will have to be responding to what the dictates are, uh, are by the Look, producers. Looking at the pricing, uh, looking at already some people who have, uh, you know, adjusted to this pricing and what it has had an impact on, uh, how much should that buffer be? How thin or thick should it be? Um, I, I, I think um, to suggest that uh, this is <laughs> how much the, the, the buffer should be, in my view, it's very important if we can have even a three months uh, leeway. Three months. Okay, three we'll, months take it. Leeway. we'll leave it at that, then we'll come and check on you, Mr. Gombo. Thank, Thank you so much for coming through Strictly Thank Business. Thank you so much. All right, this is uh, Strictly Business. I've just been talking to Alec Gumbo. He is an economist as well as the dean from the School of Business at Textila American University. Let's get into issues of tech and innovation. They are on the lips of um, many scholars when it comes to development of our country. Economic scholars are talking about how uh, value addition will do so much. But we are in the information age, and when you talk about the information age, ICT cannot be eliminated from this uh, equation. So for our take on innovation, we talk to the CEO of um, Infratel, Mr. Freelance Walia, and we talk about the issue of the acceleration of digital transformation. How is that settling in? How is it uh, operating in regards to the corporates and the SMEs? Listen to this. We have worked uh, very closely with the Smart Zambia Institute. Uh, you may wish to know that most of the digital solutions that they deploy are actually running on the infrastructure for Infratel. Um, they are systems such as the RATSA, uh, where you pay for your road tax online from the comfort of your home, anytime, anywhere. Um, this is because this system is running on our infrastructure. This is one of those systems that are running on infra to infrastructure. But um, when you look at our mandate, our mandate is uh, you know, to make it easy for enterprises to be able to set up and to operate cost effectively by taking away the burden of having to invest in infrastructure so that they can just narrow their focus on their core business. And uh, with that, we have over 200 enterprises now on our book. And uh, for us, uh, we feel that's uh, a great contribution because what it means is that the capex which those enterprises should have invested in the ICT infrastructure, they actually directed it to other areas of the business to accelerate their growth. Well, uh, when you look at um, um, uh, the private sector, uh, we have a lot of SMEs who actually do not even know where to start from in terms of uh, integrating their ICTs, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, integrating of ICTs in their business operations. Uh, what we have done is to get close to them uh, and uh, have a discussion and see how we can help in terms of packaging certain products that, uh, you know, help these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, small and medium enterprises to start strong. And uh, like I indicated before, instead of them worrying about, uh, you, know, you know, sparing some capex for ICT infrastructure, 
um, they've been able to ride on the infrastructure that we already, uh, you know, uh, invested in. Um, as you may be aware, digital transformation is not just about technology. It's a whole process of business transformation, meaning that there are other aspects that you need to touch on before you even rely on technology to give you, you know, the guarantee that you get the results. So what we have done is on this, you know, digital solution side, where they do not have the capacity in-house to develop their own solutions. We have a software development team which just focuses on interpreting the customer requirement, requirements in terms of what they want to do. And then we develop these solutions and they are able to use these solutions to you know, improve their efficiencies. That is just on the SME side. SME side. But on the corporate side, uh, there are those large corporates, uh, you know, with already established IT, you know, environments uh, on, on premises. Uh, we've been engaging with them. What we have seen is uh, usually the corporates, they would have like two, three instances running. One is the production environment, the backup environment, and the disaster recovery environment. So we have seen a lot of them having to make a decision to actually move one of their you know, uh, instances to our environment. And like I, I indicated, um, we have uh, over 200, uh, you know, and uh, a, a large number of that is actually corporates with established uh, big IT systems. So we've been able to uh, you know, provide that guarantee that there will be business continuity, even in the case of uh, disaster from their on-premises. And also there is disaster recovery where they are backing up everything and then they can recover from there, uh, from the three data centers that we have invested in. It, it's good if they are even planning to start the digital transformation journey because uh, if you don't start, definitely your business will become irrelevant going into the future. Um, what I would advise them is that, you know, when you look at digital transformation, like I indicated, there are so many parts to digital transformation. And many times people confuse digital transformation to be like you start with technology and end with technology. Um, I'll give you an example. It's, it's, it's like uh, garbage in, <coughs> garbage out. What technology does is just to give you that guarantee that if you do your business transformation and you integrate digital technology in your business operations, your results are more guaranteed and you're going to be relevant now and going into the future. So what the executives they need to do is to start with the basics of digital transformation. It's a whole big thing, but you have to eat it in small pieces. For instance, you can start with uh, you know, just uh, uh, looking at your business processes, streamline them, make sure your, the customer is at the center of your operations. You can start with uh, you know, changing the culture of your employees to make sure that their focus is on the customer. You integrate uh, you know, ideation and problems, problem solving you know, skills within your employees. Uh, you can also start with the technology that is investing in the technology infrastructure for you to be able to deploy all your systems there. But that's where Infratel comes in. Instead of the business executives focusing on investing in uh, digital technology platforms, they can leverage what Infratel has already invested in because these systems were deliberately uh, you know, designed to be able to cut off so many from a share perspective. And there are certain attributes such as flexibility, you know, and also agility of the systems, and also the ability to be able to integrate with many other systems to promote, you know, partnerships across the ecosystem. So um, that's what we do. We take away that burden, but uh, we go beyond that. If you have business processes that you want to automate, so that you can bring in efficiencies and you can be more cost effective. We bring in our digital uh, you know, solutions team to understand your requirements and come up with the solutions which you can now use in your uh, you know, business operations.
That tech and uh, innovation insert there talking to the chief executive officer of Infratel, Mr. Freelance Wadia, wraps up our show. Of course, we've had so much on the program. We've talked about the ongoing Africa mining in Dawa in South Africa, and we've also dwelled onto solutions on what someone can do who is on the consumer end on uh, the business end if you have to reduce those production costs because of issues of the fluctuation of the fuel. Join us again next week at the same time for more business stories on behalf of the entire production crew. My name is Judy Ngulube.